it's Rob again. It's time for another member talk. And first off, before we do get started, I want to say Happy New Year's. This is coming out right around the first week of, uh, of 2021, and hopefully it's going to be a better 2021 than we've seen of 2020. So we'll see what happens. But wanted to thank you for coming on and listening once again. We've got a very special guest. He's a longtime member of the Washington State Funeral Directors Association. His name is Mr. Steve Webster. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Hey, pretty good, Rob. How you doing? Good. Doing well, doing well. Excited to be here. Uh, excited to see you. I know you guys have been just going crazy uh, with everything going on. But um, a lot of us that are going to be watching this or, or hearing this know who First Call Plus is, know who Stephen Webster is. Some of us don't. So give us a little bit of a background. What what uh, What is First Call Plus and, and what do you do there? Okay. So first off, I mean, First Call Plus is a fully licensed funeral establishment, um, but our role in the industry is, is a little bit more unique. Uh, we are not um, uh, public facing at all. Um, everything that we do is behind the scenes. Um, our um, mission is to be able to um, serve and, and help with um, funeral homes and medical examiners, coroner's offices, universities, um, in supporting them uh, to help grow their business. Uh, we provide cremations, transport, embalmings, uh, really anything that you could imagine um, without uh, directly meeting with families. Sure. Well, that's great. And I know you guys have you've been around for a long time and, and you're just an awesome support for people, not just in um, you know running out of time and not having enough hands they can call on you, but you know, you, you guys go everywhere. I mean, across the state, uh, out of state, do all sorts of stuff to bring people back and, and to get them to the funeral homes as uh, the families are requesting. Yep. Yep. My, uh, so my, my, uh, my dad started the company back, um, gosh, almost 20 years ago. And he would always say that um, when the funeral home would ask us to jump, we would always answer how high. And it's, it's pretty basic, but, you know, we, we try as, as odd as the request might be, or as many times as, as we're, we're told, no, uh, we just try to, we, we get it done for the sake of the family. We want to meet their needs. And as, as odd as the requests have been over the years, you know, I feel like we've been able to accommodate almost all of them. So sure. Good, yeah. good. You got a pretty good sized staff too of people on your team there. What what are you ne looking never at? enough, <laughs> Rob? <laughs> never enough. Oh. <laughs> what do you um, got? What so first call people? You got crematory people. You've got embalmers. You've got all sorts of different things going on there. Yep. So uh, staff fluctuates kind of on the on the daily, but you know we're we're about forty five on the staff side, and wow. you know we have fifteen removal vehicles. Um, each removal vehicle in itself will put on about a hundred thousand miles per year per vehicle. Uh, we have kind of kind of our main facility in the Kent area, and then we have a kind of a smaller footprint, very similar um, um, up, but definitely smaller up in the Marysville um, mm -hmm. area. We have four. Uh, retorts in Kent. We have one up in Marysville. Um, we have refrigeration capacity for 750 in Kent and another 100 up in Marysville. So and if you would have asked me that before COVID, I would have not known that answer. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, COVID's uh, COVID's really kind of put a, well, it's, it's put a damper on a lot of people, but mm -hmm. you guys have been just kind of doing your thing. You're kind of just going forward still. Yeah, you know, it was, you know, the fog of war was Jeff definitely apparent going through this the first place really in the country, uh, not really having much um, information to really kind of at, have at our fingertips, we had to develop a lot to kind of what uniquely worked for us. Um, we had a lot of difficulties in communication and entry with different nursing facilities or different hospitals. And something that was a good benefit for us is that we've been part of the King County disaster preparedness for a number of years. So oh, sure. anytime that there had been a, a, a exposure for, oh gosh, bird flu or H1N1 or Zika or anything that else, we would develop these little kits um, mm -hmm. based off the CDC guidelines that we would be able to um, utilize um, if the need were arise. Sure. And, you know, when 
COVID hit and supplies got very thin, uh, we were able to tear into those boxes and you know use the N95s and the hazmat suits and everything that, that were in there. And we were probably down to about three days worth of supply uh, before the supply lines really opened back up and, and I had my hand out there and, 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 and thank you to you too. Uh, you sent that email out that said, hey, you know, we took you know, some PPE. Um, if there's anybody that would like some, let us know. And I, I think I was one of the first ones to put my hand up too, so. Yeah, yeah, we, we were fortunate. We had, um, but we had the NFDA and then we had our friends at LifeNet Health that actually um, provided us with some masks and things that uh, donated. And we just wanted to give those out and, and help people. And, and uh, hopefully they worked. I still got a very few limited supplies left, but uh, I'm still willing to sip, ship those out to anybody that wants them. So if you need them, call me. <laughs> yep. Well, hopefully we can, uh, hopefully uh, by the time this thing gets published, we're kind of looking at the worst numbers from being behind us. So yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. I'm gonna, I'm kind of getting over it. I think a lot of people are really getting to the point where it's getting they're really looking for that light at the end of the tunnel and, and hoping that it'll get here quicker. You know, and honestly, that, that comment right there, it, it's, it scares me the most, you know, very early on when COVID was, was happening, you know, we, you know, we gowned up and gloved up and masked up and it was very easy to understand that you need to take this seriously. Um, yeah. I, I think that fatigue is definitely setting in uh, amongst not just my team, but myself as well, where, you know, before I, somebody coming into the building, you would see them put all of this, you know, PPE on and then come in and do what they needed to do. And, and now you just kind of see those masks kind of sliding down a little bit, or, you know, you're walking into the building as you're putting your mask on and, you know, I've, I've never been more fearful where I felt that COVID has kind of surrounded us. Um, and we have been very fortunate, you know, we've, we've, de we've had some, some positives, but they've all been non-work related. So I feel like what we've put in place here is, has helped, yeah. but I, I, I definitely feel that the numbers, uh, it's just, there's just too much out there to keep it out of our place. So yeah. You know, yeah, I've been trying to hound people as much as we can, you know, to get their mask up and pay attention and, you know, and not get complacent, but it's, it's definitely fatigue is, is definitely here. So, yeah, yeah, it is for sure. Let's, uh, I'd love to talk with you about something that right now, at least you're about the only people that are doing it in the state of Washington, um, alkaline hydrolysis. So in 2020, uh, in May of 2020, the state opened the door up for alkaline hydrolysis in the state of Washington for humans. It was open. It was already opened up for for pets, and we've got a few folks that we know that are that are actively doing that or have been doing that for a while now. But for humans, you kind of played a part in that a little bit in in helping to help steer that through legislature and and get that going. But you've taken the next step, and now First Call Plus is actually operating. What I to what I'm to know of is the only alkaline hydrolysis machine in the state. Is that not correct? No, no, that is. And um, this started off for us about ten years ago, and yeah. we were uh, we had First Call Plus of Oregon and Washington, and we thought, you know, we were very excited about this new technology, um, especially from the environmental standpoint. And we wanted to do what we could about getting them legalized. Um, yeah. The way that Oregon structures their laws, it was very easy to get it in place. Um, and I didn't fully understand how difficult Washington really makes things. Yeah. So where I believe it took under a year, uh, maybe six months to, to get it changed in Oregon, it took another nine years to get it legalized yeah. in Washington. And, Amazing. you know, it, it was a long road. There there was the benefit is there's been so many changes too, and the education has gone up. You know, having our neighbor to South Oregon have it legalized was able to kind of start the community, you know, start the education up here mm -hmm. um, to get people kind of excited about it. And you know, it was legalized May of, of 2019, uh, went into effect uh, a year later this May. Uh, we had originally 
uh, we had originally planned. We took, you know, we bought the machine, had it in place, had it um, delivered in February and had my seven different construction crews all lined up. And then, you know, COVID hit shortly after that. And, you know, everything came to a screeching halt and, you know, a bunch of delays, both, both as a result of COVID and both just other delays. Uh, yeah. We just uh, started processing cases um, October 14th. So just a wow. few months so ago. Yeah. So you're up and running You're it's going uh, at least at the time of the recording here, it's still the only place in the mm -hmm. state. Um, yep. So if you want that process, we got to get to, we got to get you to Kent. It's in, it's Kent, right? It is. Kent. I always get this. Yep. I, I'm sorry to say this, but you know, Eastern Washington guys. So I kind of, everything West of Cleelum is Seattle to me. So, well, the idea is that if you're, if you're not familiar with the area, I think everybody kind of knows where Ikea is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are like, like three miles South of Ikea. There you <laughs> so. go. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited for you. I really am. I, 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 I want to come over and see the machine. I want to see it in action. Um, I've not seen one. I've seen one live i've not actually seen one working hmm. uh, so i'm excited to come over and see that with you and and tour that hmm. um tell us you know there's still a lot of people that don't understand alkaline hydrolysis hmm. uh or don't understand maybe aqua cremation or you know there's whatever they 85 different names for this thing right tell us a little bit about that process i know we had nikki Mikolai from resumation on here uh, talking before and, and she did a great job went through the process of what alkaline hydrolysis is but kind of give us a just a quick rundown of how does this process work and how is it comparable to cremation uh, well the process itself is is you know actually pretty straightforward you know it uses 95 percent water it uses five percent of this koh or potassium hydroxide uh, which is a base not an acid it's the opposite side of the uh, ph spectrum and uses um, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of heat. And the whole process takes between about three and a half and four and a half hours. Yeah. And, you know, what's left over is that, you know, the, 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 the chemical will, will take away everything, every part of the body, except for the bones, which is exactly the same stuff that we're returning to the family as well. Um, right. All the impurities are removed and, you know, like cremation, which, you know, does the same thing, but, it, it leaves this, this carbon imprint from the natural gas into the bones. Uh, since we're not using that in this process, all that's left over is just white, pure, sterile bones. Uh, we take those bones and recover them uh, like you would out of a retort. Uh, they come out very wet, so we allow them to dry for, for a few hours. Um, and then we process them uh, like you would with cremated remains. Do you use the same type of processor or is it a different, is it a specialty processor that can handle moisturized bones if, no, so, if they're not fully dry? Um, so we, we wouldn't, we, we give them ample amount of time to make sure that they're dry before okay. that we were to put them in that processor. So um, that really not being an issue, it is the same equipment that you would um, use for cremated remains. So yeah. on that aspect, it's, it's really nice to be able to use the same equipment for, for both sets. So, so one question that, that I'm going to ask you, because I get asked quite a bit, um, and I've actually seen the answer, uh, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about it. If you would, there's, there's question about implants, like mm -hmm. dental implants, gold in particular, uh, mm -hmm. hip, knees, that sort of stuff, different prosthetic joints. Mm -hmm. When that comes out of a standard crematory, a flame-based cremation, mm -hmm. sometimes it's unrecognizable, especially mm -hmm. like dental work, unrecognizable right. most of the time. The, the joints though, you can tell they've been through fire. They've been right. through, they're, they're very dark. They're, you know, sometimes they're even a little flaky Mm -hmm. uh like that very first thin layer coming off what is it like for those items when they come out of the what do we call it what what do you call it do you call it, you don't call it a retort do you call it an alkaline hydrolysis chamber do you have a special for lack name? of a better term absolutely so i'm still okay. learning this only being up from a month I'm, I'm working on my buzzwords but that that's yeah. about as creative as, as i can be at this point so okay so you know, when they we, come out of the chamber though what do they look like are they the same you know, they, they look brand new. They, yeah. it, it's almost, 
you know, it, it almost instantly warrants the conversation of what can we do with this next, mm -hmm. you know, where when you recover the metals after a cremation, you know, they need to be refined and, and melted back down in order to be used for something else. Um, I, I, I look at this stuff and it, it looks, it looks probably like how it went in there. And, you know, just like with pacemakers, I know that there's a couple uh, universities out there that has a recycling pro process and they take them in and they strip out components and switch things out. Um, and then they ship them overseas to be reused in communities that can't afford having, you know, those that those prosthetics available to them. And going forward, I, I don't see any reason why that the same things can't be done now for these these metals. So, sure. yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned something there and, and I lost my train of thought, but what, uh, what is the question? <laughs> Sorry. I had it right at the tip of my tongue. And for some reason it left, but no, I, I mean, the way it goes. well, one of the things that the, this process, when I first set out on this, you know, it was environmentally based. I have three young daughters at home or seven, five yeah. and three. And you know, when I look around and, and people kind of challenging each other, you know, what can we do for the environment to be better at this? And, you know, this is one of the reasons why I, I got into this is for the environment. And that was very early on. And, you know, now that I'm actually processing cases and looking at cases, um, I, I just, I, I look at this and I see, I, I see how gentle the process is you know, to the body. I mean, if you look at cremation and everything else that we do, it's, it's pretty violent, I guess. Um, we're all kind of used to it, but it is kind of violent what we're doing to the case. And um, when, when we start these processes and then when we open the door up and take a look at what's left over, um, the position of the bones is almost in the exact position of, of how the case is, is placed in there. So I know that inside of that chamber, you know, we're not, we're not jetting water across and we're not stripping or anything like that. You know, we're simply, you know, we have a pump on there just to simply move water around to keep the, the process going. Um, but looking at that and seeing how pure the white, the, the bones are and, and seeing that the bones are in place of, of how the person lied in, was lying in there, uh, just tells me about how, how gentle that process is. And, and I, I didn't think that that would be that it would have an ef as much of an effect on me as it has. Uh, it just it just is gentle, you know. It's 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 calming. I mean, even when turning the, you know, when you turn a retort on, um, you know, you have the blowers that come up. You know, there's a bunch of heat, and when you start this process, you know, there's just a couple clicks and pops, and kind of away it goes. Yeah. So, so when you say gentle, we're not talking like uh, hot tub jets that kind of stuff it's just water's just slowly moving around to well i mean i wouldn't say not gentle. knowing actually the the velocity of it in there i i would probably say it's more of of a jetted tub approach but yeah. i mean when i'm when i'm recovering you know bones that are in place from a you know from the feet or from the hands they're, they're still sure. right next to the person so i i can't yeah. think that the water's being moved that that quickly through the process gotcha well, uh, my age is showing, but uh, I did remember what I was going to ask you about, and <laughs> and it's something that you mentioned, and it was pacemakers. Is with pacemakers now they have to remove from crematories uh, before cremation takes place. Mm -hmm. Is that the same scenario with alkaline hydrolysis? Are pacemakers needing to be removed before they enter into the alkaline hydrolysis chamber? You know the my stupid knowledge of electricity tells me that when it re when that pacemaker releases a charge in a water environment that that current is going to have to go and find something right. and you know have an electrolysis um you know whatever it does you know breakdown of that piece of metal but you know we've done i think i've recovered maybe four or five so far and they all they're all left in place. We don't remove them prior to, and the machine is, is able to handle all of that. And wow. from the, from the data from resumation doing this now for, you know, 20, no, 20, 30, almost 25 years, 
Um, yeah. They've never had any issue with with pacemakers before. So, Good. you know, another yeah. way for us to not not being, you know, less impactful to the body. Yeah. Now, this is a process that's only legalized still in just a few states. Are we seeing more states that you've beings that you've been a part of this for 10 years? Are you seeing more states coming in and accepting this as a legal and, and uh, proper way of, of disposition? Mm -hmm. or yeah, is it so kind of hitting a plateau until till more people get involved. Well, I mean, I think it's it's a, a member of each state tr kind of taking it as their own and kind of going through the responsibility of, of getting it legalized in their own state. I know there's a couple states that that have been a little bit more against it and some that have been, been quick to adopt. Um, I know that COVID is probably resetting all of this thinking, but um, the last I heard that there was about four or five additional states that were going to be coming up in 2020 or 2021. Um, I know that all those conversations have been paused at this point. So I would say that once things um, get back to normal, we'll probably see a bunch more states come, come, come up all at once. Yeah. What are, I don't remember. I think we were like 18 or 19. Do you remember the number Washington was when I think we were in, I think we were 20. Did we get to we number were. 20? Okay. Maybe, well. maybe. I don't know for sure. Yeah. I know yeah, that there was a couple, there was a couple states that, that passed it before us, but then had a two year um, window until they were going to legalize like California. So, um, and then we came in after them. Right. So, and the interesting part about it is um, besides adding the disposition, uh, new dispositions, the two new dispositions, I should say, that came in on 2020. We also added new operator license. So it's not just a, a it's not just a process that anybody can do. You have to be a licensed and trained professional to be mm -hmm. able to operate these, for lack of a better term, large machines. Absolutely. I mean, these are yep. these are good sized machines that um, mm -hmm. to have a huge footprint and and um, are doing mm -hmm. quite a bit of uh, well, in some cases combustion or other cases. Mm -hmm. hydrolysis absolutely i, I mean i mean lo lo long overdue and it's it's yeah. you know as you know the state is pushing 80 percent cremation mm -hmm. uh, the need to be able to have you know operators that can understand you know not just the operation of the machine i think the the thinking on on being certified is is less important with the operation of these machines because most of these machines nowadays i mean i know my alkaline hydrolysis machine i i answer four questions and then i essentially yeah. walk away i can monitor it remotely i can make changes they monitor it back in in england uh, you know if there is any issues you know that's less than it's about to to, to be able to to have an an operator understand you know what a legal cremation authorization should be or or a burial transit permit and you know, the things that, you know, when, when we look at paperwork, you know, especially since we're, we're a third party looking at other people's paperwork, you know, we look at this, that, you know, these documents need to prove to us that we can, that we can move forward. We don't look at them like we're trying to find something to stop us. We need proof that we can go forward with the cremation or an alkaline hydrolysis um, in order to do that. And anything that can provide additional, you know, programs that can provide additional training to help people understand why we ask them to do that. And um, is, is, is going to be a huge benefit for us. Well, it makes sense. I mean, what we're talking about is the, once you start, there's no stopping. I mean, you're disposing of human remains. Right. And it's, it's not a process like, you know, they say you can always unbury somebody that's been buried if there's mm -hmm. an issue mm -hmm. but the reality is with what we're talking about of of cremation of of alkaline hydrolysis and even the the new one natural organic reduction once you start that's it you need to you need you're taking on a huge amount of liability you need to have somebody uh that knows what they're doing behind that that's that's operating that and sure. i i'm I was excited when it came out. I know that we had a lot of folks that kind of called and said, what in the world? I've been operating this machine for 20 years. What do I need to be certified for? But you're right. It's not about how to operate a machine as much as it is about how to avoid avoid the, li or the litigation that comes from messed up and the liability. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's and it's, really, it's not necessarily... 
and it's not necessarily something that may touch, you know, our facility or anybody else's facility. But, you know, if that if that education helps with one case over the entire state, uh, then that's one less news article that the rest of us are left explaining to our families how this won't happen at our place. Absolutely. And and with your position of what you're doing, um, you're an extension of that funeral home that's that's having you do these processes. You are part of that funeral home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I do not want to stand up in court next to them, no. <laughs> despite, despite how long I like or how much I like them. <laughs> no, I don't want to either. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I think, you know, it's, saying. you know, this, this, you know, when, when natural organic reduction and alkaline hydrolysis came, you know, it was a good opportunity to kind of take a look at, you know, other changes that needed to be made. And, you know, a lot of them uh, were met with great, you know, feedback from the associations and from, you know, just the funeral directors as a whole. And, you know, I, in my opinion, that these were, these were good. And of course you're going to have pushback, but, you know, go through the class and, and then you don't have to think about it for another five years. Yeah, it's pretty, and they make it very simple, very simple yep. class. Yep. Yep. And uh, I mean, you guys, you know, reaching out to, uh, it was Kana, right? That yeah, to Kana. set up the operator training that to, to help the members. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, uh, it's a huge benefit. Well, yeah, we, we enjoyed doing that kind of stuff. And we, you know, we did the training once here in Spokane, brought out Mike Nicodemus from NFDA. And this year we used Kana. Um, we're we're going to keep doing it and, mm -hmm. and keep it up because there are going to be people that need it. Uh, but it, you know, it's exciting for us to be a part of it too. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny when you look at it. I mean, I'm assuming that you worked with your father when he kind of started First Call Plus 20 some odd years ago and, and kind of seen it. You can probably attest to this as well. There really hasn't been any changes in what we do for a hundred years. I mean, for the most part. And now all of a sudden, in the last, let's say, two or three years, the amount of change that's taking place in funeral service has just grown exponentially. Mm -hmm. the, the alkaline hydrolysis, of course, it's been around a while, but it's now taking hold. Uh, composting or, or organic reduction, that's starting to take hold. Uh, you know, all these things, even with embalming, I was talking to an embalmer the other day, he's got a remote control button on his embalming machine so that, uh, he doesn't have to reach all the way over and, and, and run to the <laughs> machine to turn it off. If he has to turn it off real quick, he can just do it from the flick of a switch on his, on wow. his remote control there. I mean, it's just crazy. The stuff that's being added and changing in our, in our profession, just in the last four or five years. Absolutely. And I was, uh, I was speaking with a funeral director that had one of our very early cases and she just, you know, she was astounded. She just couldn't believe how excited a family was to have, to be able to do with, to do this process. Mm -hmm. And the director was telling me, you know, I've never, I've never had the joy of meeting with a family that has been excited about going through this process. And to hear that, you know, she was, she really didn't know what to do with herself. So she sure. was just saying that, you know, the family was excited that this option had come on and, and, you know, she wanted to give me a call and let me know, you know, about that feedback about, you know, having a, a very positive experience out of it. So and not just yeah. being able to offer it, but, you know, having it mean something personal to a family. Um, I, being the idea early on that, that I wanted to start thinking about making a change to cremation and having a alternative to cremation uh, that was more environmentally friendly was was the first driver for me um, mm -hmm. but speaking about you know and having a couple situations very early on you know one is is you know with that funeral director being able to say you know that she had a positive experience with a family um, I had another um, I had another family that the funeral home had put me in contact with and um, to her, you know, the, her, her son was, was getting ready uh, to move on. And she was so in love with the idea that he could be surrounded by water because uh, he was a big surfer and that was very important to him. And um, I even had a pastor. Uh, he called me up, he came in here and he said, and this is like more the religious side of it, which I thought was completely off the table for me. And, you know, uh, more of a pet project over the next 20 years of trying to get some of the re religious groups to, to think about this as an option, right, right. you know, and he came in and he said, 
when I speak to my congregation, I'm paraphrasing, quoting the best as best as I can. But he goes, when I speak to my congregation about cremation, I, I equate this to hell on earth. He goes, everything in the Bible has taught us that fire is not good. And he goes, when we are brought into this world, you know, we're surrounded by water. And he goes, when, when, when I baptize people, I baptize people in, in, in water, not fire. And now to be able to tell my group that we can now leave this world surrounded by water as well. He goes, this is something that's going to be very important to me and, and to my congregation. And he said, even, he said, even now going forward, if you ever see a little bottle of blessed water or holy water show up with a person and your instructions are to, 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 to have that water be used in the process, just know that that's coming from me. So, you know, when starting off, yeah, when, when starting off on this, it was really just, it was environmentally based. And now very early on hearing these stories, I, I feel like this could be an option for, you know, for, for all the, you know, for all of cremation. Yeah. So well, I definitely see that it's going to grow uh, tremendously. I, I, if I, if I have a crystal ball, I have a feeling that this is going to be an option that's really going to take off. I do. And I do. I, one thing um, before we wrap up here, I want to just kind of reiterate um, and it's something else that you mentioned very early on, but I think it needs to be reiterated because whenever I have this conversation, I always hear the same thing. Uh, and it's, oh, Breaking Bad. No, it's not. Hmm. We're, this is a water and a basic form uh, what you said it what was the chemical that was in it uh, it's potassium hydroxide so it Which, is as far away from acid as you can get to yeah. you know when we are you know that that's something that i should i should touch on too is that you know the the machine has this this option to meet the need of what the community is asking for you know when, when installing this machine um it was told to me very early on that we needed to to be on city water and it's city drain just to get everything passed and in place without having any backlash sure uh, this machine is is able to adapt with changing conditions you know if if water becomes an issue uh, we can switch over to rainwater uh, we can switch over to gray water we can switch over to black water uh, we could even use salt water uh, this machine is capable of handling all of this wow. yeah um you know, for now we are we are going to city drain, and you know are in the process of looking at alternatives for that as well. Um, it is it is thought that the effluent that's left over after this process uh, can be used as some kind of fertilizer at, at some point um, um, in the future. Now, do I think that we'll be spraying that on apples and oranges? I, I don't. Uh, do I think that we'll be spraying that on wheat that's used to feed uh, cattle or livestock? I, I don't. But I, I do believe that there could be a need to use this maybe on wheat for biodiesel. Um, mm -hmm. This could be maybe used for on timber for construction lumber. Um, or even the little flowering pots that we see zipping around the cities. Um, yeah. So I do believe that this this can kind of change with the times. If 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 water becomes an issue, um, it, it can definitely adapt to that. Well, and from what I gather and what I understand about it, the effluent, the the residual, the the leftover water or the water that's produced, mm -hmm. totally sterile. Is, is is that not correct? It is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So technically the harm would be other than getting over our own emotional side of it if it was worked on or used as a fertilizer on wheat fields or whatever it still wouldn't negatively affect you're not you're not fertilizing a person onto no. that mm -mm. you're you're, you're using yeah. it as a very as a sterile water it's not I, going to hurt it I think the real I think the real harm would be for me to say I've done enough and to not keep going. Um, I think very, very short term, I'll start looking at collecting rainwater. Um, I've already started looking at finding alternatives for going to drain at this at this point. Um, I think very early on, I could look at doing something as simple as um, reaching out to some cemeteries in the area. Uh, to spread yeah. it, you know, on the cemetery level, because I know that 
that that could be something that would be easy to just start the process and then to just kind of see what it turns into from that. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of options. Lots of options. Yeah. Hey, Steve, this has been great. I, I love having you on here. I uh, really it's been a, it's been a long time. I've been wanting to get you to come on. And I know we've tried a few times and right. schedules right. didn't mix and, and you just, you know, different things. But I'm excited for you. I really am. I think this is going to be a great thing uh, there in the Kent market. Uh, and I think that it's going to spread all across the state. If somebody say where I'm at in Spokane or, or different parts of the state wants to say, Hey, uh, this is what we want. We want to do this. Mm -hmm. Do they go to their funeral home and have their funeral home contact you? Do they come to you direct? What, how does that work? Nope. I mean, so again, since we are not uh, public facing at all, um, everything okay. needs to be handled through their local funeral homes. Um, it's just, you know, that's, that's the way it's, it's always going to be. Yeah. And um, my goal in this is to uh, grow together and to present more options together with the different funeral homes. And mm -hmm. um, yep. And then even, you know, for people over on the Eastern, you know, Eastern Washington, you know, being able to help facilitate with transportation is something that's, that's definitely we're able to help us have help sure. as well. So. Okay. So we need funeral home partners to partner with, with Steve and, and first call plus to say, this is a new offering. It's out yeah. there. It's available. Have your mm -hmm. families if they want it. We'll take care of you. And we'll make sure that at least for right now, we'll make sure that we get you to Kent for the process and get you back home. Uh, just like we would with a with a cremation or any other type of disposition. I, uh, I, I really thought at this point, you know, I would be able to get on the road, you know, thinking about this years ago is get on the road and being able to walk into nursing homes and facilities and actually yeah. be able to meet with people. I, I can't think that that's going to be coming back anytime soon. So yeah. uh, having that conversation, you know, after a passing is, is, is going to be important. And, sure. you know, I've heard you know, some, some really su successful way of bringing that up is when you sit down and somebody says, you know, I'm here for cremation and you go, well, would you want flame or water-based cremation? And, you know, and the family's instant reaction is, you know, what is that, you know, and it gives you, you know, a couple minutes to introduce that. And it's, you sure. know, it's not wall called water cremation. It's, you know, alkaline hydrolysis and, you know, yeah. it gives you kind of a chance and, you know, it's an easy way to present to a family. Um, and, and if they're interested. Sure. Yeah. And just real quick, uh, one quick question, same authorizations. I mean, can you use the same authorizations or does it have to say alkaline it, hydrolysis it, on there? It does. And if yeah. anybody wants to reach out, you know, I can help you um, send out, you know, the authorization that works uh, right. for us or help you incorporate it into your own. Um, it should not be saying cremation. It should be saying alkaline hydrolysis or, or whatever you want to call it, but then parentheses alkaline hydrolysis. And uh, just to make sure that it's definitely known that they want this process over that process. Sure. Okay, good. What's a good email? If we want to reach out, we got questions. What would be a good email that, uh, reach out to you on uh, steve at firstcallplus.com all okay. spelled out awesome it's been great steve thank you so much for coming on and uh thank you for being a part of the association thank you for what you do uh, i know that just you're a huge benefit to funeral service um in so many different ways and i, and I don't know if you really realize how big of an impact that you do have uh, I know funeral homes all over the state, all over the country that they, they need something. They call First Call Plus. So uh, thank you for what you do and um, keep it up. We love having thank you. you so much for having me on today. And, and um, yeah, I can always answer uh, any other questions that come up. I know I didn't really touch on the technical side of that, but um, if anybody wants to know, they can always reach out. And um, sure. if they have questions with families, you can always you know, have the families call me direct. I'd love to, I'd love to interact and, and help anybody else out that I can. Yeah. Awesome. Steve. Hey, thanks a lot, buddy. We'll see you soon. Yep, and uh, see, see everybody else uh, next week. All Bye right. everybody. Yep. Take care.